So talk to me about, so you talk about voice embodiment, explain to us what that is. Well, so voice is a very physical process. Um, We have the voice apparatus happening between say, well, actually I should say at the top of the head because the head itself is a resonator for the voice. So it even goes up to the top of the head. But in terms of what we're consciously doing with our body, it's happening here at the mouth and the throat. But all that's, that's involved is the entire torso. Interesting. Everything kind of above the pelvic floor. We have the diaphragm that drops all the way down yeah. there and we have the lungs. And when there's tension in these parts of the body, it impacts the voice. So being embodied in the most general sense, I think is about feeling that you're in your body, feeling aware of your body, and then your body being able to be more of an expressive instrument so that your feelings, your thoughts, your breath are all kind of aligned with what you're saying, what you're feeling, your message. And there is so much that we have around socialization that is necessary socialization Mm -hmm. that can shut down the voice. So the voice is very free when we're born because it's our survival. It is how we communicate as babies. Immediately, is the baby alive? It's crying. That's, is it breathing? And then it uses that breath to make sound. So voice is immediate from the moment of birth. And you'll also see how babies know how to breathe. Their ribs are moving like gangbusters when they're sleeping, like on their tummy, you'll see it. Near their belly, yeah. Yeah, it, it, it's, it's really apparent. So we, we all have that capacity. But then as we socialize, we know we need to speak nicely or use a particular tone, or it's not okay if we say certain things. And, and so there's an awful lot psychologically that ends up happening to the voice. And then the voice reflects that. It can become bound. It's, it's also where we hide, right? If we don't want to express how we feel, what do we do to our voices? So... Yeah, I I never thought about that, but yeah, it's true because if you're in a social situation and you're either embarrassed or your anxiety kicks in and you you could just, you feel it and you, and you don't articulate because you're uncomfortable. And then, and then maybe you can feel into this, Kellyanne, what, I mean, what do we do with our bodies when we're anxious? What happens around the throat to sort of, and the breath, right? We stop, we stop, stop breathing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And we tighten our tummies and we bite back on this. And there's so there's an immediate physical reaction. Also, voice is powered by the breath. So it's tied into the nervous system, both autonomous and sympathetic. So we breathe whether we know it or not. It does it without us. We breathe mm-hmm. when we're asleep. Yeah. But we can also come in and direct the breath. We can choose to hold our breath. We can choose to stop breathing. We can choose to breathe shallowly. Sure. So how we breathe can affect our nervous system. So if we're nervous, we we know now, and there's numerous people and practitioners um, and even scientists who will talk about, yes, certain breathing practices really change the nervous system. So they calm the nervous system. They calm the nervous system, yeah. So it ties into so much. Yeah, absolutely. So walk me through how that works. Like when you're in a room with somebody and you're, you're trying to get them to use their own authentic voice. Right. So I see everything here. I'm gesturing to my body as, as our instrument, because as a performer, I know that my body, my voice, my, my mind, the emotions I could express, these are all, these are all my tools and they're all expressed through the body. So I won't start with, okay, now let's bring out your authentic voice. Because what <laughs> yeah. is that? You know, they may not know yet. I don't know what their authentic voice right. is yet. That's, that's a journey for them. So what I would do is start with breath exercise that supports voice. And then we would move into um, very simple sounding out and, then, and discovering the resonances. So I'd actually take them through a certain yeah. amount of voice training Okay. And, and this was the thing that touches on what you were, I think, most interested in discussing, which is the body-mind connection yeah. in, in learning, the, the intellect-body-mind connection in learning. So 
we tend to think of the mind as being the executive director of everything. But because there's been such a wonderful renaissance in neuroscience in recent years, we know that what we actually do with the body forges pathways and connections in the mind. Yeah. So everything is not coming from the mind as um, sort of as that directive, always that directive leading presence. The mind is also very receptive. The brain is receiving messages from what we do and what we think and how we hold our body. And because learning, traditionally learning, has been so head-led, and not just in the U.S., mm -hmm. um, we tend to always approach with intellect. And this happens in the U.S., particularly in um, acting processes. Let's, let's have thoughts to create emotions. That's a particular right. modality in acting. That is, I think over relied on when there's nothing physical also to support it like movement and voice yeah but what about if we simply explore with our bodies and see what that what what we discover there so when clients breathe differently just simple simple kind of a breath meditation mm -hmm. they always find it rather extraordinary providing they can sink into that because it can feel a little awkward at first right yeah but there's usually a wow, I immediately felt X, or I felt it can be any variety of things, or I noticed this about my body. So back to your question of how do mm -hmm. I start, we start by opening up the instrument and trusting the process. So there's an awful lot of me guiding people through, right. this is why it's helpful, because well, why am I just sitting here breathing? We're used to end gaining immediately. I want to speak better, so now I need to practice my speech rather than, oh, let's find out where your breath lies. Let's find out what's impeding your voice. Let's, let's encourage your voice to do things it's never done before. The vocal exercises That's will really sort cool. of have you sometimes doing things that remind you of singing, but it's in order to discover where are the outer limits yeah, yeah. of your voice? Where does your voice sit? And that in turn immediately changes, it can immediately change how you feel about something with your voice so mm -hmm. when we breathe more deeply we feel more relaxed and present when we articulate more fully through our ideas it cues the brain that we have the right to speak things like that so that's what I mean by uh, say harnessing the body mind connection in learning mm -hmm. is that we can start by doing with the body seeing how it makes us feel being curious and observing, noticing our critical voice and working with the critical voice, which is something I do as, as well in my program. And then, so it's a combination of the very technical, the psychologically observing, the self-explorational. It's, it's a combination of those things so that we're not just using the one modality of analysis or um, technique without discovery, Mm -hmm. to get to where we want to be we're because it takes it. time we're working with muscles when we change how we speak or breathe or any of those yeah. things at first yeah. we don't know what we're doing because we haven't done it before it's like doing a new weightlifting exercise if you're yeah. activating a muscle you don't usually activate you know how long probably that takes right you go yeah, where is it where yeah. is it where is it and then you go <laughs> oh there it is there it is it's like that yeah. that's amazing that you do that so have you had people come in like you had talked about earlier like oh I, I noticed it. And then there's some people that are like, I don't, I don't need this. You know, this isn't for me. Or do you find that they're better actors after this? Oh, well, I should emphasize that at the moment I work with more business professionals than I do with actors. So this voice work is truly for everyone. So I've had someone in the Navy. I've had someone who's a clinician in a hospital. I have someone who's a researcher in academia. I have teachers. Okay etc cetera, etc cetera. um the class i'm doing at the moment out in the world in july is actors but my one-on-one -on -one programs tend to be geared towards towards business, business. um yes yeah. yeah, so so that sort of hijacks your question um <laughs> can, you, can you ask that to me again <laughs> okay i was just wondering and, and i because i was thinking actors and i was like if, if you do with an actor does it make them a better actor and they've yes they're they're all in 
like their whole bodies in. Yes. Yeah, so a lot of actors will come to me because they've been told that they don't, that they're too quiet on stage. So their training may have really focused on emotion, but mm -hmm. not on expression for the audience, depending on, on what, what they're working with. Right. And there are some wonderful teachers out there who understand that what they're teaching is one piece, but it's not the whole piece. And will say, well, you need to go to voice. You need, right. to, you're rather stiff in your body. So again, it's like opening up the physical instrument mm -hmm. and yeah. What they'll find is, again, if they're bound in their voice, the emotion may come up and we very commonly, and I sometimes do this too in my life, personal life. I don't want to feel that feeling. I really don't want to cry right now. I'm really not wanting to feel yeah. this feeling of prayer. Yeah. I'm going to cry, right? 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 <laughs> so we're used to going, oh, unpleasant feeling. Let's just push that down or Shut not for the moment, yeah. you know? <laughs> so that may be the knee jerk. So they may have these emotions come up, but suddenly be piling on without will without meaning to yeah. all this tension up in the upper body and then the voice comes out like this you know so that's yeah. an exaggeration but that's okay. basically what can be happening and so it's it's understanding that by really utilizing the breath what you find is breath and emotion are so tied so if you can just let it if you can breathe deeply, the emotion will flow. Yeah. But you'll also, which is wonderful and necessary for actors, be able to move with the breath into the next moment of feeling. The feelings change. The best acting work is one in which the feelings and thoughts are changing very quickly in a quite a mercurial yeah. way. Go from one thing to another, to another, to another. Sure. That generally makes up some of the best writing so hopefully it's in the writing, but also acting, yeah, yeah. Uh, acting performances is where there's that facile ability to just, just keep changing. And when you're able to use the breath and, and you're able to, mm -hmm. to gesture naturally from your body for whatever that expression and that, and how that character will move right. and do. Right. And you have an expressive instrument. If you haven't opened up that instrument, well, great. You can be doing all the acting you like up here in your head, but, it's not but you go. don't. Yes, no. it doesn't. It doesn't get expressed out because we're not acting for ourselves. <laughs> no, yeah, we're we're actually yeah. acting for the, the audience, right? Yeah. yeah. And it's just like a, in, in a way, because I took a breath breath work class, and it's that release of whatever you know trauma, whatever you've got going on. And, and once you release that, if you're able to, it's like, oh, it's just, it's just your shoulders, everything is like, oh my gosh, I just really, I don't know what it was, but I, you know, had to cry it out or whatever. And I released it, but you talk about business people. And I think that's, you know, a good thing because we talked about, or in your bio, you talked about um, public speaking. So knowing what you know now, would you have done differently when you were just starting out? Uh, knowing what I know now about, about public speaking? Just about yourself in general. like All uh, about myself. You yeah. mean starting out as an actor? Yeah, and then coming Oh in. my gosh. Um, I think that I would have kept working on my voice as almost just a practice that feels good. Like I think that it's easy to sort of, when you've trained at a school like I trained at, it's easy to sort of say, oh, well, I'm done. And now I'm gonna get better with every job I do. And I'm still learning. I, I was very aware that I was still learning, but, yeah. but not going back to the exercises that we were taught, it was really only with the maturity of being in that, um, MFA and revisiting some of the voice work, very mm -hmm. similar voice work to what I'd done before that I went, oh, you know, that, yeah. that was like a gift that I gave myself. I, I kind yeah, of had I to have it. children to really appreciate any moment I got to spend in my body and with my work, right. you know, um, without my body being mainly in service to others, basically. It was yeah, like, exactly. so that became the yeah. biggest joy ever was to go back and train more. So 
I tend to think things are as they are, you know, so do I regret? No, but what I would say is to any young actor, oh, keep learning when you're done with your main training, right. keep learning and definitely include movement and voice. Always, um, yeah. Yeah. Keep moving. Does, so your experiences in this, did it help you as a performer? Are you still performing now or are you just? Right? The last time, so the last time I performed was, 20 it was before the pandemic I just finished a season at the pop-up globe in New Zealand uh-huh. in a shake in which is all Shakespeare so it's a one it was a wonderful Shakespeare company yeah. and um that was the last thing was that the last thing I did I, I've got some stuff going on with my plays at the moment but that was the last thing I did what I don't tend to do is actively pursue that I I love projects that I really love and so if I'm approached or there's a special opportunity yeah I will act again but it does tend to mean being away a lot Mm -hmm. um I'd also like to do more film I love doing voiceover I've really enjoyed doing voiceover in the past so so that's the complex answer to yes I'm still an actor it's not my central focus and you've so you've chosen to this so voiceovers what have you done Oh, I'd love to tell you things like, you know, (laughs) this famous brand that you know. Um, Often documentaries or short things that people need here and there. Um, And again, I had I had a really nice voiceover agent in San Francisco, and she was the only person who focused on voiceover particularly. And then she retired and did not pass her agency on. And I was in a big transition, so I didn't continue to pursue it. It's a lot about um, also the voiceover world has gotten trickier because of online. So there's a lot of people being paid very little to do it. That's the other truth of, I I spoke to her before she left and she said, yeah, this is getting a lot harder. People don't want to pay the rates. Really? Yeah. Unless you're a top uh, person, of course, but, but generally keep it's, it's true also in the audio book world. There's audio book. Yes, me too. They're my meat and drink in terms of me walking around the house, cleaning and doing whatever I'm doing absolutely all the time. One of my friends is a uh, a well-known Audi guy, Simon Vance. Um, He's on Audible a lot. And it was him who told me, I mean, he's still able to do it, but he said, oh my gosh, it's getting so hard. They're they're paying people $50 for a book out there. Like, and it's hours of recording, right? I mean, craziness. I want to say that my numbers may be a bit off there, but this was a conversation we had about it at a point when I thought, oh, I might like to really pursue this more. And I decided that, uh, no. (laughs) Some people like him are still being paid a living wage, I believe, but yeah. Yeah, Everything's gotten a lot harder these days. You know, things have changed quite a bit, you know, but uh, I mean, people find their niche. You found yours. And- yeah, absolutely. I love working with people as well. I really, I really like processes of transformation and supporting mm-hmm. people through that and seeing their discoveries and helping them feel more empowered. I just, I love it. I yeah. absolutely love it. I learn from it myself yeah. and really enjoy my clients. So that's, that's amazing. That, it's a pleasure for me. We're all, I never tell myself I'm a hundred percent complete, like a hundred oh, no. or whatever it is, or, you know, okay. Cause there's always learning, I'm always learning. And I never want to stop learning, you know, so I'm never going to say I'm a hundred percent. Right. I, I think the phrase is, is being a lifelong learner. That's, yeah, that's absolutely true for me. And it's something that I, I love doing. This is so amazing. So we, we I'm going to bounce back to public speaking for a second. Yes. So, what is the fear of public speaking so common and what are some of the misconceptions about what it takes to be an effective public speaker? Oh, oh, well, that's, I love these questions too. So, so my belief or supposition, or at least thesis statement, (laughs) is that (laughs) fear of public speaking is actually really primal. So it, it, it comes above fear of death, but you'll see there's actually a connection there with death. So 
I think it comes down to the fact that to stand in front of our group means to stand apart from our tribe. And so we're looking at them and we could be rejected. Now, the flip side of that is we could feel this tremendous sense of connection, which I felt sometimes as an actor with an audience. Right. So there's a huge opposite payoff possible there, but we don't think about that. We think about all the fears that come up. What if I'm laughed at? What if I'm ridiculed? What if I make a fool of myself? What if I, what if I, it's all about public shame. And in our, not just our primal past, even in the more recent history, if you look at a few hundred years ago, um, if you were exiled from your country, exiled from your tribe, you might die. Exile often meant death because you would not be accepted into another place or people. Okay. And we certainly still have plenty of othering in our society. And it was on a much sort of starker, larger stage in mm -hmm. the past, right? That's something we're still working with, but it was very, very clear in the past. So difference could mean danger. That's it. So that is why I think it's so frightening. And um, there's a phrase, we, I died on stage, right? I died on stage. So it is likened, it is connected in our psyche to dying, social death. Um, Fear is real. I mean, public speaking is, it's not one of my, my things personally, yes. but- You're um, doing it now. I, I know. Yeah, you did, did you know? <laughs> I'm not in front of thousands of people, but like on a stage being stared at. Right. But, um, and I, and I see that, I see how people can be scared. And there's like, it's, it's so debilitating to some people that they just pass out. Oh, yes. And I think that, um, what was your second question? So the first one was, Oh, so what are the public speaking? Right. So what are the misconceptions about what it takes to be an effective public speaker? I think one is that you have to be an extrovert. I'm an introvert. You wouldn't know that if you were listening to me at the moment, you know? <laughs> um, and for me, it's about, even, even for this really lovely conversation, I have to sort of, okay, I'm gonna, I'm, now I'm going to be, I'm going to be showing up. I'm going to, yeah. I'm gonna be out there, right? Yeah. The rest of the time, oh, here I am. <laughs> You know, here I am, I'm you know, just being quiet. Yeah. So, so um, I choose my social moments. I choose, I, I go, this is a performance moment. Okay, I'm, I'm going to be out there. And then I can retreat from it. So that's how I deal with it. I say, this is not me always. This is me right now. And I actually really enjoy it. Um, yeah. So I think that's, that's a misconception. The other one is that public speakers are born, not made. And that's not true. And in fact, one of the most wonderful videos I saw on YouTube around this is a TED talk by Danish Damani. Danish? Danish Damani. It's spelled as we might say Danish. Okay. D-A-N-I-S-H. Damani. So what is, what is yeah, that? It's actually D-H-A-M-A-N-I. Okay. And, and he also now, is someone who deals in the world of public speaking and teaches public speaking. But he talks about his absolute terror of public speaking when he moved as a child from Pakistan to Tanzania. And he had to speak in his new class in Tanzania. And it's, it's really beautiful and it really exemplifies he was certainly not born a public speaker, but he is now and there he was doing a TED talk. It's, it's a really good point. And I'm going to look it up and I'm going to, I'm going to listen to it. Um, because a lot of these women that I talked to, yourself included, um, never were speakers. They didn't use their voice. They didn't speak it. Like that. And all of a sudden now they're like, I'm out there. I am telling everybody my story. I am speaking. I did a TED talk. I did this. So it's not so much just like you said, it could be anybody. They weren't meant to talk in public they didn't never wanted to talk in public but they want people to know their story it's a need to speak yeah i think i think it has to do with the need to speak yeah. and that can come in many forms you might have a need to speak and not feel like doing it but it it does have to do with having a a powerful why of some mm -hmm. kind and getting tools i think a miscon the misconception behind public speakers are born 
not made is almost that it doesn't require particular technique. If something requires some technique, you can learn it. That's the, that's the plus side. I don't know if there's any specific technique. I think if you're gonna get up there and tell a story, you, have yes. to you can tell your story. That's true too. That's true too. I think what I mean is though, that if you're struggling with it, there's no shame or blame there. Yeah. You just need some skills you haven't learned. Sure. Yeah. Right. Some sense. people are naturally good at it or they're able to speak as they would to a friend. We can all speak, right? If we mm -hmm. can speak to one person, we can speak to many. But for those who speak very well to one person and then get out there and just everything goes wrong, there are skills and techniques they can learn to become good at speaking. Yeah. I also think one of the things in my own opinion, that people might be scared about talking about or talking in public is, you said fear of judgment and stuff, but I also think it's like fear of like sounding stupid or you don't yeah. know what you're talking about, you know, so being judged in that way. Like if you're talking on a specific subject, say you've been through something and you're talking about it, but these are your life experiences. So right. you shouldn't be afraid to be wrong because in right. your experience that was that was right right yeah so there's a lot that could go into that there is there's there's a lot also around if you're speaking from your experience and you and you're able to stick with what is true for you it's also hard for people to say well that's not true you know right. yeah I felt I experienced these are words that people can't really uh, you know really <laughs> really argue with um also i think that if if we're not experts at something it's it's really fine to say that we can still be up in front talking about what we do know and then touching on areas we may not be as expert on that that can sometimes happen there may be some subject that is intersecting with ours and we can refer to someone else or we can yeah, say I, I i'm not sure about that i'm not sure so that's the thing too is when i talk to some of these women it's like I, I, I tell them right up that I'm so naive on what you're going through. I have no clue. I've never, that's never touched my life or, you know, please explain. And because, and I'm, and I'm not judging them. I'm just like, I just don't know that. I don't know that side of life, you know? Mm. So it's interesting to hear them talk about different situations that you've never experienced in your life. Mm -hmm. You know, so I can't sit here and judge them. I've never experienced it. Right. Absolutely. And choosing who you're going who you know the situations that feel right to you what feels what feels like it, what situations call you to speak mm -hmm. and what situations don't yeah and there's room all of room. them <laughs> yeah and there can be room for that in even a meeting there can be room for that in a conversation sometimes knowing when not to speak or to leave a question and let there be a pause others will step in so that we don't feel that we're entirely responsible for a conversation event or meeting where we build in the question and then it can be uncomfortable to leave the silence but then others will feel uncomfortable and then they'll feel like they need to fill it so that's another thing to think about it doesn't have to all be on us yeah but it can also you can also have this person in a conversation say a group of people a small group of people this one person that is so big like this oh yes personality you know and you're just kind of feeling like i can't yes. contribute to this conversation you know i've had that so many times i think that's true too of being an introvert yeah totally. and, and i start just withdrawing that's yeah that's it, it's interesting there's if there's a lot of energy in the room uh -huh. you may feel like well I'm not sure if this is the place for me to contribute and also you don't want to fight yeah, oh, for, no. for the for the stage as it were yeah. and so that may not be the best use of your energy might not be and I've like learned over the years to like you know my energy it's not worth it at some situations I'm just I'm I'm out <laughs> yeah yeah and I'm out <laughs> I I often have slightly more extroverted the closest people to me are more extroverted to me than me. And I think it's because when we go places, I can just sit there. <laughs> you know, um, I can, and then I can contribute. They'll, you know, I can still contribute, but, but I love sometimes that that person will just take the space because I can retreat. Yeah, I 100% I agree. I have some friends like that too. 
Did you ever have a fear of public speaking for yourself? Oh, definitely. It's taken me a while to just be natural on YouTube. Um, yeah. It's so different showing up as yourself. That's what public speaking is. It's showing up as yourself. Mm -hmm. And do I still feel nervous before I go on stage in a, in a performance so. as an actor? Absolutely, I do. But, but I've rehearsed it many times and a lot of it is about preparation. And that's true for public speaking. Preparation is really key. I've had people who work with me who say, well, I never go through what I'm gonna say out loud. And I kind of liken that to playing an instrument, a wind instrument. And the whole time you're practicing, you're just doing the fingers. You're not actually making sound. And then <laughs> would you go out on stage for the first time and then yeah, blow yeah. into that instrument, right? So, so definitely practice really helps yeah. with that. But yes. The mirror, whatever, yeah. Yes, I feel nervous when public speaking for a moment. I feel a little tiny bit nervous when I'm about to go on this podcast I it, it it's no there's nothing wrong with that it's yeah. expecting that we're going to feel a hundred percent confident if we transform our central challenge with public speaking no we're human and yeah and yeah. yeah exactly so um yeah so speaking of like practicing in the mirror, so explain what are mirror neurons. So is that kind of like mirroring? Like oh, okay. So mirror neurons are these, okay, not being a scientist, I'm going to tell you what I know, but okay. also use this as an opportunity to say there's certainly some gaps in my knowledge. Mirror neurons are in the brain and they, um, are related to, let, let me just talk about the experience first. I think, it's, I think it's easier if I talk about the experience of it, is if I'm watching something and it's a thing that I've done many times, particularly if I'm, my body has done that thing and I, or I've had that experience, I may have the same response chemically in my brain and my body as when it's actually happening to me. Oh. Yes. So the mirror neurons in our brain will mirror the experience that we see, most particularly if we're familiar with it. Now, not to the point where if I see someone break their leg and I've broken my leg, I'll feel actual pain, but the nervous system will respond. Right. And this is why watching things is so exciting, arousing, terrifying, whatever, right? You can, we yeah, can see how emotion. many things there would be that we could be watching that can trigger us. This for a performer is a wonderful thing to know. So the breath being so tied into the nervous system, if we breathe in such a way as we want the audience to feel, that translates to them even if they don't know it. So this is where being an embodied performer means that our performances of any kind will be much more impactful on our audiences yeah. because they those who are most sensitive to it it varies will have an echoing response i'm a much more responsive audience member as i get older because i've had more and more and more repetitive or whatever wide range of experiences yeah. so i go oh uh, you know when i'm watching <laughs> when i'm watching something i'm very very sort of I do the same um, thing. I, these you know i'm like i i am there you know right there exactly and that's why that's that's definitely one of the reasons why when we know that as 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 performers we can say oh if i calm my breath and i'm very present my audience is more likely to relax and also be present with me and that comes into another thing that we can do as speakers which is focus on how we can serve the audience what am i what do they want to hear what am i giving them what right. what is going to help and support them today how am I speaking in such a way that just even speaking more slowly and more with more articulation helps them not have to reach for what I'm saying? You know, it's helping to connect with you, right? Yes, yes. So that we're having a connection. This is now, I might be in front of the group, but we're having a wonderful human experience. The more that we can do that. Um, I'm just going to give you one other example because I experienced how palpable mirror neurons are in that in that it's happening without me knowing it 
when I've been teaching a movement class and I'm and the breath is always meant to be part of what we're doing and and I'd suddenly find I sort of was breathing very shallowly or holding my breath why am I breathing shallowly or holding my breath as I'm teaching the class yeah. and then I'd go oh they're not breathing and I'd say okay breathe <laughs> because I was mirroring them without realizing it it was that subtle that as I'm watching them and they're not really breathing or using the breath they're breathing very shallowly I stop I stop breathing yes. it's an interesting point you bring up because it's it's kind of like your whole body is connected but especially when you think about it, like when you're around very negative people, mm. that ne you could feel it in your body or, or around someone who's, you know, in a, in a trauma situation, it's, it's, it's very weirdly connected. Like, yes, feel that emotion. Yes. And I would say that what we call energy is something special that we may not fully understand and so it can be mystical and it can be physical like mm -hmm. these things sure. we have electricity in our body so maybe that you know that is some of what we're picking up on with people yeah. right but yeah. also their bodies are doing all these things when they're feeling things yeah um yeah oh i want to give you one other example yeah. because this is a really cool study that kind of backs up the body mind connection and again it's you know how can we have a little bit more control of our experience mm -hmm. there was a study at the university of cardiff in wales i think in 2012 it was small but they were testing the body mind connection in this particular way they had a control group of people me now let me see if i'm getting this right a control group of people who did not have Botox, but they all had perhaps other cosmetic um, augmentation of their faces in some way, right? But they didn't have Botox. The other group all had Botox in their frown lines. And some of the people in that group had had depression and were on medication. All of the people in that group reported an increased state of happiness, those who had had Botox over a period of time afterwards, than the people in the control group who did not have anything preventing them from frowning. So that's the key point. The Botox in the frown line stops you from frowning. So those who had had depression before and had the Botox found that their depression lifted and some of them went off their medication oh. because they could no longer frown. So I don't know if I set that up very clearly, but it's, it's a very interesting way in which, yes, what we do with our faces changes how we feel. That's a very interesting study. Yeah, I think it is. It's, it's one of a number of studies that's, that's looking at the, the somatic aspect of I do and then I feel rather than I try to change my feelings and then it's expressed, which is true too. Yeah. Yes, our body expresses what we're actually feeling, but we can likewise decide to put our bodies in a different posture to feel a different way. I'm going to have to take some time and look at that. That's a really interesting study, you know, because I don't know if you, this has ever happened to you, but sometimes I'll walk into a room and you could feel the energy. Sometimes it's yes. so negative and I'm just like, I, I, I have to leave, you know, or it's like this massive, really good energy, you know, and you don't want to be away from it, but it's, it's true. I feel that for me, I it's, feel those. It's the downside of being sensitive, isn't it? Yeah. I cry at everything. Hallmark commercials during Christmas. You know? <laughs> <laughs> well, but then it sounds like you're a person who's able to have some emotional flow. Yeah, I do. I, I mean, I don't hear you saying you stay with with those things. I don't. I don't stay with it. But it, it's some, like I finished a series the other day, and the ending of the series really got to me. And like I've been talking about it for days. I was like, I was so like invested and just like I wanted it to go a certain way, and it didn't. And I just felt it. I felt like like you were talking about that. I mean, there they were portraying such good acting that I was there, and I felt yes. everything they went through. Well, and it's the human experience. So some people will say, oh, but it's just a story and they're able to stay somewhat detached. But if we really like being immersed in these things, when I'm affected by a piece of art, I'm always going, yeah, but that happens. I mean, these things actually happen. Right? Yeah. And so yeah. that's, that's where I am when it's affecting me. Yeah, that's awesome. I love that. So what is your, let's see, how, 
explain how your greatest fear is often tied to the thing we love or want most. Oh my goodness. You're asking me all the questions. Oh, <laughs> so, um, gosh, I had a really great example for this. Um, I think it's to do with the thing that we love is the thing that we fear sometimes. So, um, I want to run a successful business and I'm passionate. This is not necessarily me. This is example. Okay. I'm passionate about this. I'm going to start this company. But the only way that I can do this is to ask for help. Because I need to get the word out. I need to network with people. And I hate asking for help. It makes me feel somehow disempowered or I think I should be able to do it all on my own. But if I want that thing, I've got to work through this thing. Mm -hmm. Most of the important things in my life are like that. Me too. It Perfect. could even be, I'm passionate about the partnership that I'm in. Being in that partnership means I need to show up in a particular way. You know, yeah. and, it, and it allows me to have to really grow because we come up against the crunchy bits, sure, you know, yeah. whatever it is. It's like it, it. So the thing that you love, there'll be something that it requires you to do that is a challenge. Usually there's almost always something contained in that. Yeah. Yeah. That's that's crazy because, you know. Uh, yeah, emotions are crazy because, you know, you want to show up and you want to be this person, but, you know, every situation is different, but you don't also don't want to be tie your happiness to that particular person or that particular thing that you're going through. Mm -hmm. You internally have to make yourself happy. That's true. And I think, I do think that all the things we want uh, require us to transform something in some way, right? If we have a goal that's out there that we don't yet have, it's requiring us to transform something. Yeah. And if you're a person who loves that challenge, I, lo I love that, I love transformation. I think- I love it too. And I love seeing people when you see it in people and that, and all of a sudden it just kind of clicks and you see it you're like that aha moment for them. Yes. I love it. I yes, love it. yeah, that's what I love about being a coach. But it's true for me, like, you know, my best friend and I encouraging each other, my partner and I encouraging each other. It's always about, well, what are we learning? What, what, what's the learning in this situation? Oh, look, there's that thing you just hate. There's your Achilles heel, but this is an opportunity to work it through. So I think we can't control, much of the time, we can't control the things that happen, but we really have control over how we hold it. Yeah. And Sometimes we are victims to things that occur, but we have to find a way to what it, how can I approach this that's going to be the best for me? I can't control it. This is happening to me, but how, what can I get out of this situation? Yeah. And it might be something really small because the situation might be so hard, but yeah. that's usually a first step on a journey to figuring out, oh, why is this happening? Yeah, is there some way I can feel empowered, even yeah. though this is pretty disempowered, you know? Maybe try to find that little silver lining, but also don't let fear stand in your way of moving forward. Yes, I think much of the time it's fear that holds us back, you know, and that idea of the person starting their business, but they've got to say, have their friends all try the product and get them to, you know, yeah, go on this journey and they have to ask for that. Um, there's a great opportunity for connection there and how much how and, and what could be the payoff their friends get to express their love and they go oh that you know actually now I know how much my friends love me they said sure why would why would you even mind asking and and then they come through and then you feel less alone so there's there's often really great things on the other side of the threshold but crossing that threshold whatever it is for each individual yeah can be really difficult 